I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. During a summer in Siskiyou County, California, a native witness saw something moving that he at first thought was a bush, but was in fact a tall, hairy humanoid that was covered in thick hair that resembled horse hair. There was also a strong, musky scent. The humanoid had soft brown eyes and moved slightly. The witness made a motion of friendship and laid down a string of fish for it, which the humanoid snatched up and went away with. A few weeks later, the same witness heard strange noises outside his cabin in the early morning and found a pile of fresh deer skins ready for tanning lying there. As the witness looked at the gift, he heard the hairy humanoid calling out nearby. Other times, wood for fuel, berries, or fruit were left there. My name is Margaret Whitney. In 1944, I was nine years old and my brother was eight. We lived in Northern California, just off the Klamath River on McKinney Creek. We were walking on a dirt road and passing a clearing. Across the clearing, about 50 yards away, we saw three strange animals. It was like looking at Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. From where we were, they seemed to have long necks. Their arms hung down almost to the ground. We stood and looked at them. They looked back at us. My brother and I kept asking each other, What are they? They turned and walked back into the woods. We ran home to tell our mother. She insisted that we saw sheep. We know they were not sheep. Later years, when Bigfoot was reported, I know that is what I saw. The animals stood and watched us for a good two minutes. They had long hair that seemed to glimmer white in the sun. When they turned back towards the woods, their hair seemed black. My brother Robert and I were the only witnesses. It was daytime before noon, but after 9 a.m. It was a clear day with no clouds. The area was redwood forest. It had very thick growth. During October 1947, a man and his wife were driving on Highway 99 south of Shasta when they saw what they thought was a post in a washout. They stopped to see if the road ahead was clear. The post then started to cross the road. It was actually an 8-9 to nine foot tall creature covered in long reddish-brown hair which came up to their car and looked at them before crossing the road to look at the bank before returning to its original location where there was now a female creature. The male then helped the female across the road and then up the bank. They walked into the trees with their arms around each other. In July 1950, on Mount Vernon and Rialto Streets, off State Highway 10 in San Bernardino County, I heard whistling and wood chomping noises and looked towards the sounds and saw a hairy man-like creature, very muscular. It saw me and stayed there for approximately two minutes. It then walked into the tree line by the edge of Lytle Creek. I went back later and found footprints by the creek. Some friends said they saw the creature eating crayfish by the creek. In Eel River near Eureka in Humboldt County, in 1950, a 10-year-old girl fishing with her family had gone for a walk in a meadow when she saw a red-eyed creature with the strangest-looking fangs and wearing tattered and torn clothing that barely covered him. The creature was reported to have been covered in hair and was seven and a half to eight feet tall. The nose was very large and flat against the face, and the hands and feet were enormous. The creature made an odd growling sound and came close enough to hurt the girl, but did not. The little girl, in the meantime, ran away as fast as she could. Sometime in 1952, near Orleans in Humboldt County, a witness who was driving through the forest one rainy night came face to face with a Bigfoot. This was one terrifying night, and even though the creature appeared menacing, when the witness raised his fist, the creature backed off. This happened when I was 12 years old, so that had to be in 1950. I was camping in the Los Pedros National Forest. I was riding along a hill following a trail down to water in the Sepsi River. About 50 yards from the stream, I saw three Bigfoots getting a drink. I knew bears and monkeys, but this was something I had never seen before. I just sat still on my horse, and when they saw me, I raised my hand as if to say hi. The largest one raised her hand, and in a little while, she took each of the two little ones by the hand and walked up the trail. I waited a little while so as to not scare them, then rode down onto the stream to give my horse a drink. The big one was about the size of a teenager. I think she was babysitting the two little ones. They all had reddish-brown hair, but not on their faces or hands. The teenage one had the beginning of breasts. 
They did not seem to be afraid of me in any way. When my horse finished drinking, I rode up the trail, but didn't see any of them. This is all true. I've told a few people, but they said I was lying. That's why I've never told this until now. I think people should leave them alone, but no, they won't. It was mid-morning, and the day was sunny. In Broadmoor in San Francisco County, at 8.05 a.m. on October 26, 1956, Mrs. Faye Swanson found the body of a small furry animal like a monkey in her yard. The small hairy humanoid appeared to have fallen from the sky and had struck the clothesline with such force that a solid 4-inch by 4-inch post had been shattered. Near Borrego Sink in San Diego County, sometime in 1939, a prospector camping in the desert was approached by several hairy creatures covered with light-colored hair and with glowing red eyes. The creatures surrounded his camp and menaced him for some time, but apparently were kept at bay by the blazing campfire. On May 11, 1947, Mr. and Mrs. Ross Trouble were fishing near Fall River Mills in Shasta County when they saw two smelly Bigfoot walking along the riverbank eating fish and reeds and leaving tracks 17 and a half inches long. My dad, my brother, and I were deer hunting just north of Donner Lake along the utility road running east-west in the fall of 1956. They left me with my dog, a beagle, on a large boulder while they went east along the road in the pickup truck. They were going to try to flush some deer out of the brush and have them run toward me in the clearing under the utility lines. They must have driven several miles because all was quiet until I looked up toward the top of the ridge behind me and saw an ape-like creature, eight or nine feet tall. It was sandy brown in color, rather lean, and especially graceful in stride. It was walking smoothly and rapidly down the top of the ridge toward the utility road, crossing the road about 40 yards from where I sat on top of the boulder, which was about eight feet tall, with a loaded 30-30 rifle across my lap. My dog, Tippy, ran off barking at the creature, disappearing in the pine trees about 30 yards north of the utility road. I was scared stiff, but knew I was downwind of Bigfoot, and he apparently did not see me. I had no thought of shooting him, as I did not have any confidence that I could stop him with my 30-30. I could hear my dog barking for a long time, 10 or 15 minutes, all the time getting further away. I waited about an hour and a half before the dog finally returned, and my dad and brother returned about 30 minutes later. I never told anyone about this until many years later. I thought they would think I was crazy. I had never heard of Bigfoot at the time, and did not become aware of other sightings until several years later. It was early afternoon, bright and sunny, and the wind was blowing from the Bigfoot's direction toward me. This happened in the summer of 1957 in Eureka, near Old Arcata Road. I was about 10 or 11 years old, with my brother 15 months older and a friend my age. We lived in the country outside of Eureka. We went fishing at the end of our road, Old Hansen Road. As kids would do, we wandered off in the woods and found an old logging road that we decided to walk up. About 15 minutes up the road, we heard a noise in the woods on the other side of the road. We huddled together and waited to see who was there. We saw a creature on the other side in the trees. We began to run back down the road, and the creature kept pace with us, although we knew due to its size it could easily go faster. It stayed in the brush and trees, and when it got ahead of us, it would stop and watch us, but never came across the road. It just followed and watched from across the road. When we reached the center of a clearing on Hansen's property, we stopped and looked back. It was no longer there. About two years ago, I asked my brother if he remembered the incident, thinking it was something I had just imagined, and he said, just as wide eye as that day, yes, it was real. It would have been mid-morning, and the weather was clear and sunny. It was a wooded area with redwood trees. At Bluff Creek near McKinleyville, on the 12th of October, 1958, Mr. Roy Wallace, a construction worker, was asleep in a shed when he was woken by a commotion outside. He opened the door, and an immense, hairy, man-like beast was standing there, right in front of him. In a split-second gesture of appeasement, the man gave a chocolate bar to the beast, which took it and left. At Elk River, near Bluff Creek, on October 12, 1958, Mr. Curtis Mitchell found the bodies of four dogs and saw a tall, hairy humanoid that ran upright like a man that was 8 to 10 feet tall and wore nothing. The bodies of the four dogs that were found that evening were ripped apart. One had been slammed against a tree. 
The dogs' bodies were found five miles south of Eureka. At Riverside, on November 8, 1958, Mr. Charles Wetzel was in a car when he was attacked by a six-foot-tall humanoid with long arms and no ears. The creature had fluorescent shining eyes, a round head, and protuberant lips on its mouth, and all over the body it was scaly like leaves. Gurgling sounds came from it, and Charles was unsure if he had hit it with the car originally, as there were long sweeping scratch lines on the windshield found afterwards. At the same time, the radio station dissolved into static. The hairy humanoid clawed at Charles, who had reached for his pistol, and accelerated the car away. This happening was on the north end of Main Street, crossing the Santa Ana River. On the following day, the 9th of November, the same six-foot-tall humanoid with long arms and no ears and a scaly body like it had leaves on it was seen. It had fluorescent shining eyes and a round head and a protuberant mouth and made gurgling noises. Beale is an active Air Force base now and has changed a lot. The area that we were in was about three miles northeast of the main part of the base. There were barracks there when the Army had it for training. It was called Camp Beale and had some 80,000 acres. The Army abandoned the camp many years before this took place. The Air Force reopened it in 1960. But in 1959, a friend and I went deer hunting in the hills above Marysville, California. At the time, Beale Air Force Base was closed, so we went on the base in the mountains. We camped out in the old barracks area that first night. My friend had his two retriever dogs with him. It was dark and we were in our bedrolls. We heard a very loud yelling, almost a scream, coming from the woods about a hundred yards away. The dogs went crazy and headed toward the wooded area. My friend and I grabbed our rifles and followed them. I've never heard a sound like that before, and just before we got a short distance away from the woods, we seen something that the dogs were running around. It was on two feet. It grabbed one dog, threw it some distance, and swung on the other dog. I had it in the flashlight beam, but couldn't see it too well. It turned toward us, and my friend said that it had a face like an ape. It bounded into the trees, and the dogs were called off. We did not stay there that night. Mr. Hill was a miner and had a claim on the Trinity River in 1960. His home was in Redding, California. I grew up with his daughter. This very fine family would never lie or exaggerate the truth. This story was told to me by Mrs. Hill. It was during the summer of 1960 that Mr. Hill was away from home working his mining claim. It was a warm summer day. Mr. Hill had worked his claim earlier in the day and was napping that afternoon under a tree along the river. He awoke to see a creature standing in the river looking at him. The river was approximately six feet deep and the water reached the creature's chest. The hairy creature stared at him for a moment and then walked back to the opposite side of the river. It then crouched down behind a bush and continued to stare at Mr. Hill. Then it would change locations along the bank and just stare. The ape-like creature finally walked into the timber. Mr. Hill went to his home in Reading and was so terrified that he did not leave the home for almost two weeks before returning to the claim. This incident happened in 1961 when I was 19 years old. My friend and I were bear hunting up in Humboldt County on the Hoopa Indian Reservation. It was March or April. Back then, bear hunting was open all year long in Humboldt County, and there were no limits. We were from Southern California and were totally unfamiliar with the area. We stopped in town on the Trinity River. I believe the name of the town may have been Willow Creek. I'm not sure. Anyway, we met some natives in town and asked them if they knew of any good places to hunt bear. They said they didn't, but added that there's an old man in the grocery store who may be able to help us. They then pointed to an old 1950 Buick parked in front of the store and told us that the car belonged to the old man, so we waited there until he came out. When he came back to his car, we introduced ourselves and asked him if he knew of any good places to hunt bear. He told us it was pretty good up on the Hooper Reservation and gave us some general directions. We ended up on an old deserted dirt road high in the mountains in my friend's dad's 1949 four-door Chevy. We kept on going until we hit snow, started to fishtail, and the right rear wheel went over the side. We set the handbrake and got out of the car to evaluate the situation. We decided to get the bumper jack out of the trunk and jack the car up, and then push it off the jack back on the road. The plan worked, and all four wheels were back on the road. We backed down the road until we came to a place where we could turn around. By now it was dusk, and we decided we had better pitch our tent before it got too dark. 
At the turnaround spot next to the road, we saw a very big pine tree and decided to set up camp under the tree. By the time we pitched the four-man umbrella tent, it was dark. We put all our sleeping gear and firearms in the tent and lied down, and we were talking for about ten minutes when we heard the first grunt outside the tent. We both pretended that we didn't hear anything and kept talking. Then it did it again. This time we both stopped, and I asked my friend if he heard that. He said he did, and also heard it the first time, and I said, yeah, me too. Now we both shut up and listened. We could hear it circling the tent because the ground was covered with bark, and we could hear the bark crunching under its feet. We could also hear its very loud breathing. By the sounds of its footsteps and its breathing, we figured whatever this was, it was huge, and it was walking on two feet. It circled the tent several times, and we decided that one of us should go out and see what it was. Neither of us wanted to go out, because we were scared, so we decided to flip a coin to see which one of us would go. My friend lost. I then suggested that before he went out, it may be wise to fire the forty-four mag out of the tent flap first. He concurred and stuck the barrel out of the flap and fired five shots. We then both went out. He had the forty-four, and I held the light. We looked all over and didn't see a thing. We went back in the tent, laid down, and were trying to figure out what had just been outside the tent. And we'd been talking for about five or ten minutes when we heard a very loud, high-pitched scream that lasted for about five seconds and sounded like it was up to a hundred yards away. We looked at each other and asked, what the heck was that? That was one heck of a scream. We talked a little longer and then went to sleep. The rest of the night was uneventful. We arose the next morning and went outside and looked around the circumference of the tent for footprints. We couldn't see any because the ground was covered with many years' accumulation of bark from the huge pine tree we were camped under. We had wondered many times what it was that had been outside our tent that night and often talked about it. Then one day, several years later, I happened to be in the barber shop getting a haircut. I picked up an Argosy magazine and it had the now famous controversial picture of the female Sasquatch on the cover. I read the article, and in the article there was a map with an X on it. The X indicated where the picture was supposedly taken. The X on the map wasn't far from where we had camped that night. That's when I made the connection, and since then, after reading about many encounters, I'm pretty well convinced that the animal that we heard outside our tent was a Sasquatch. At Fort Bragg in Mendocino County, Mr. Robert Hatfield, a logger, was visiting Mr. and Mrs. Bud Jenkins and they thought they had heard a dog howling in terror. They went outside and saw a hairy humanoid only 60 feet away from them. It was huge and had a near-human black face, stubby bristles around its mouth and cheeks, and almost human eyes, and was peering over a fence that was six feet tall. The head and chest were clearly above the fence. Bob's first thought was that it was a bear, and he ran into the house to get the others. Both men dashed outside, but there was nothing there. Then Hatfield ran around the corner of the house and ran straight into the humanoid, which sent him sprawling. Hatfield yelled out, It's half man, half beast, and raced back for the door with the Bigfoot on his heels. Hatfield just got in, and both men held the door shut as the Bigfoot kept pushing on it. They could not shut the door, and Jenkins got his rifle and loaded it. The strange visitor then vanished. Later, huge footprints were found that were 16 inches long with one toe missing. A handprint was also found that was 11 inches across. One evening in August 1962, on Apricot Avenue, about a half mile from the San Joaquin River in Patterson, while riding my bike just after sundown, my dogs started going crazy. I looked at my dogs and saw that the hair on their backs was straight up. I looked in the direction they were barking, and standing in a sugar beet field, 30 to 40 feet away was a humanoid figure covered in long, shaggy, gray hair. This thing was massive, and I would imagine was at least 8 feet tall. It didn't move, it just stood there looking at us. Needless to say, in 1962, I didn't know what Bigfoot was, so I turned my bike around and got the heck out of there. My dog, who's a collie and Australian shepherd, beat me home. My nephew told me that a friend's mother saw a white Bigfoot about the same time and area. Also, a friend's family had an unusual occurrence at their dairy farm near where I had my sighting. On January 27, 1960, a horror tale of a 10-foot-tall man led sheriff's deputies into a dark, brushy area west of Cold Springs. 
Officers were unable to spot a monster, but returned with an equally horrifying report of unidentified shrieking sounds. There's definitely some creature in the woods, Deputy William Huntley confirmed. I've never heard anything like it. Huntley's partner, Albert Miller of Cold Springs, a veteran woodsman, agreed. I've never heard a sound like that in all my years in the woods. The search was touched off by an anonymous telephone call to the sheriff's office about 8.30 p.m. The caller refused to give his name on the grounds, you'll think I'm crazy and put me in a straitjacket. He reported seeing a man, at least 9 or 10 feet tall, on the road near an old gravel pit. Huntley quoted the caller. It was moving around. It appeared to be human, but was the most awful thing I had ever seen. Huntley said the caller added, I'm scared, I'm an adult, and I'm not crazy. I'm not drunk. I don't even drink. Huntley said a second man then came on the phone to confirm the story. The second man had not seen the monster, Huntley said, but he reported seeing tracks more than 14 inches long. Huntley and Miller then drove to the area. In first radio dispatches to the Sonora Sheriff's Office, they reported hearing sounds something like a human in distress. It's heading right towards the car. Here it comes, Huntley advised. After a delay, he reported... Now it seems to be circling the car. It sounds more and more like an animal of some kind. But the two officers reported they could see nothing in the heavy brush. It's definitely not a bear, Huntley radioed. Albert thinks it's more possibly a mountain lion, but that's not a mountain lion noise. The two officers shouted at the creature and noticed their shouts didn't even seem to scare it. As they attempted to move closer, however, the sound seemed to move away. The officers were forced to head back to Cold Springs when the car's gas supply ran low, but they returned to the spot a short time later and found the unidentified creature still shrieking. Huntley said they stayed in the area until 1.30 a.m., but were still unable to spot the source of the sounds. The officers returned to the scene during daylight, but found nothing to explain the mystery. There were no tracks, nothing to indicate anything at all, Huntley advised. In March 1963, in Mariposa County, when I was 15 years old, me and a friend were outside of Coulterville. We were at a ranch, and we were in bed looking out a window from a dark room. The window was six feet off the ground. There was a full moon outside. A Sasquatch looked in the window and was looking around the room. We watched it for about ten minutes. He looked around the room and then looked around outside and looked inside again. My friend told me to go outside and look around, and when I did, I could see nothing. The Sasquatch had a head larger than a basketball, and it stood about seven and a half feet tall and must have weighed four to five hundred pounds. The head looked like an ape's head, and the eyes were about the size of tennis balls. It had lots of coarse hair, which was dark brown. This occurred at about 10.30 p.m. During the summer of 1963, in Mendocino County, a sighting happened in Piercy, which is 12 miles north of Garberville. We were all playing and having fun with a bunch of people at the Cooks Valley Campground in Piercy. A bunch of the kids were roughhousing and playing, making a lot of noise, when we took notice of a terrible stench. It smelled like the carcass of a rotting deer and skunk combined. It really stunk. We looked around to see where the smell was coming from, and there, at the edge of the tree line, stood a huge ape that we here in Garberville recognized immediately as a Sasquatch. He had been standing there watching the children play. He never made an attempt to come into the campground any further, but just stood there watching all the activity on the playground. At the nearest, the Bigfoot was about 50 feet away from the closest child. He was brown, hairy, and stood at least 8 feet tall. We only smelled it and then took notice of it. We stared back at it for a short length of time, and it walked back into the woods. All of us saw the Sasquatch. It was the summer, about 9 o'clock at night many years before the famous film was made in Bluff Creek. This encounter happened at a small mill town called Myers Flat. Two friends and I were hunting up an old logging road, roughly two miles up the mountain across the Eel River from town. I was far ahead of my friends and decided to scare them as they came up the trail, so I climbed up some rock cliffs for a better advantage and settled down within some huckleberry bushes to wait for my friends. After things quieted down... I felt the hair on my neck starting to rise up. My two friends were nowhere in sight. I noticed a small movement in the berry bush right behind me. I stood ready to run when this thing stood up also. It didn't hesitate, but turned and walked off into the bush. 
I heard tree snapping and the crunch of dry leaves echo away as I ran back to my friends who were still 200 yards away. After I calmed down, we went back to the spot to look for some sign. My friends believed I saw a bear, but I know what I saw. We found where something was squatting down and stripping berries. I had disturbed its meal. Small trees were just broken off at about four feet from the ground as the thing made its retreat. It was a sunny day about two o'clock in the afternoon. Near Yosemite National Forest in December 1963, Sheriff's Deputy Albert Miller discovered several awesome tracks in the snow near a garbage dump. They were not bear tracks and were 16 inches long by 6 inches wide and 6 to 8 feet in stride. There were many local witnesses of an enormous hairy humanoid 10 feet tall with a 6 to 8 foot stride. In December 1963, the deputy sheriff from Pinecrest reported hundreds of 15 inch tracks with a 5 foot stride in Leland Meadow, a popular recreation site. No casts were made, but news of the tracks made the local paper, the Union Democrat. The sheriff came to the location because the footprints were reported by local residents. It was early morning, and the tracks were in the snow in the pine forest, about 6,000 feet in elevation. At Bluff Creek during midday in 1963, a hairy humanoid appeared between two work gangs installing 48-inch concrete culverts into the earth. Earlier on, there had been reports of these culverts having been torn out of their fresh beds and been thrown into a stream. This time, when the work gang returned to the truck carrying the culverts, the truck, as well as the culverts, had been upended and thrown onto its back, and fresh footprints were found on the gravel road around the damaged truck. At Mount Shasta in 1963, a deer hunter that was very badly hurt after a fall had a most unusual encounter with a hairy humanoid. The deer hunter was carried back to his camp in safety by a white-haired Bigfoot with a musty smell. At Mount Tamalpais in July 1964, at 9 p.m., two campers were disturbed by a pair of animals three times. Then two humanoids were seen that were very muscular and had no necks or tails, though they appeared like large cats. They were chittering away at each other for seven hours. Mr. Paul Conant saw one that had no ears, was five feet tall, tailless, and walked on its hind legs. The creature was lion-like, weighed 200 pounds, and was very muscular below the shoulders. At Blue Lake on September 13, 1964, Mr. Benjamin Wilder was asleep in his car in an uninhabited area, when at 1 a.m. he felt his car moving. At first he thought it was an earth tremor, but when it happened again, he could not hear any rocks falling, he switched on a light, and saw a large creature standing outside that was covered with shaggy three-inch long chest hair holding both of its arms on the car. Ben shouted at the creature, but it only made pig-like noises back. Ben then sounded the horn, and this scared the creature off. It walked away on its hind legs over a hill. Ben could not see the creature's face. One day in August 1964, in Pine Mountain Campground in Ventura County, an unknown ape-like creature walked upright out of a thick patch of bushes and stood there looking for several seconds up and down the fire lane. I cocked the hammer back on the 32 caliber carbine, shouldered the weapon, and began to press the trigger. Something in my mind ordered me not to shoot the creature. I asked myself if this was a bear. Instantly, I decided that it didn't look like a bear because there was not a long protruding snout jutting up from its face. Besides, bears are not legal game in this area of California. It certainly was not a buck, never mind the fact that if it was a deer, there were no horns on this animal. I immediately told myself it looked like a monkey man. I can hear myself today saying those words out loud. What the heck is a monkey doing out here in the mountains? In the meantime, I made the move to shoulder the carbine and spoke those words. The big animal turned towards me from the waist up. Looking over the sights of the little carbine, I observed this being to be about seven or eight feet tall, with well-muscled, long, hairy arms hanging down past the waist. The hands looked almost human. I remember noticing these things as I slowly put down the gun. The creature was completely covered in long, dark brown hair from head to feet and appeared to have a huge barreled chest. Some other striking features that I noticed were a flat, square-jawed face, a flat, dark-looking nose, no noticeable hair on the face, and a sloping forehead. I don't remember seeing any signs of ears on the animal, too much long hair around the side of the head. 
and there was no discernible neck. Since I had no idea what this creature was, I've always been glad to have instantly decided not to shoot it. The other thing I thought, at the time, was that this thing could be some idiot in a monkey suit playing a prank on some hunter like me. But then, only a village idiot would dress up in a monkey costume and roam around the mountains during deer hunting season. As I contemplate the incident today, I realize now that this was a Bigfoot, and it had both seen and heard me. I could not tell what sex it was because of all the long dark hair around the body. However, now that I've seen numerous showings of the Patterson film in which Patty was documented, I must guesstimate it was male in gender. Within 10 to 15 seconds, as quickly as the creature had entered my field of view, it calmly made about two strides across the open fire lane, parted some tall bushes with well-muscled, uplifted hairy arms, and disappeared into the thick bushes. Right away I noticed that it was now standing inside the screen of thick brush along the fire lane, like it was watching me. I could readily discern the huge dark shape as it stood there for possibly a minute or so. Apparently it was looking at me sitting uphill on the ground. I don't know at the time whether it was going to attack or leave. I kept the little carbine in the ready position against my chest and slowly stood to get a better look at this unknown animal. I decided at that moment when I stood up that if this thing would charge me, I was going to run back up the hill to my dad, unless it got too close to me. Then, and only then, would I consider shooting the animal. I admit it, I was scared fit to wet my pants. I now recall seeing the bushes shake violently, and the dark shape stepped out of sight. I slowly sat down again, and listened to its rustling footsteps as the huge ape-man descended down the hill away from me. Boy, I was glad it was gone. Now the shake started. If I had been smoking in those days, I would have lit a cigarette and probably smoked the whole pack. Finally, after about 15 minutes, when the stillness was broken by singing birds and scurrying chipmunks, I got up enough nerve to carefully go down to the spot where I had seen the creature. Was I dreaming? No, because there, in the loose dirt, I saw a couple of huge, human-like, barefooted tracks where it had crossed the fire lane. Then a raunchy odor hit my nose. I remember thinking it smelled like a horrendous fart. In fact, at the time, I decided to call it the fart creature. I know that's not a very endearing name for such a marvelous being, but that's how my scared brain was working that fateful morning. Deciding that now would be a good time to leave the area, I quickly walked back up the hill to where I had been sitting and stood there for a few minutes. Clearly, I had seen something unexplained. Now I had to decide if I should tell my dad or just keep quiet. To tell you the truth, I was afraid to tell my father, because I knew he would never believe me. I thought he would most certainly take my hunting privileges away for seeing boogers in the hills. I began slowly walking back up the firebreak toward my father in the piney flats above me. I remember now he asked me why I had left my deer stand so early. I think I replied that I was hungry and bored at not seeing a buck right after daylight. He probably chewed me out for leaving so early, but at least I didn't incur his wrath for telling a booger story. This occurred in November 1964 in Trinity County, near a little town of Xenia, right next to the Six Rivers National Forest. Some friends and I had come home late from a dance and were sitting in the house tuning a guitar when all of a sudden we heard this loud wail or cry coming from outside. It was cold but no snow yet. We went outside on the porch and could still hear this piercing wail. It stopped and started again as we tried to tell where it was coming from. Across from the old house was some rock bluffs about 80 yards up the hill. The sound seemed to come from atop these bluffs. The cry started at a lower key and rose up in pitch and intensity and lasted at least a couple of minutes. We got scared and went back in for the night and locked all the doors. The next morning, Arden and I went up to the bluffs and found a cleared area about 30 feet across. The small trees had been pulled out of the ground and thrown to the side. Everything else had been trampled down flat. The ground was too hard for tracks, but there was a hard smell in the area. My neck still feels funny when I think about that call. I grew up on a mountain along the Eel River. I can't tell you the exact year that I had this sighting. Not sure if I was 11 or 12. That would put it at about 62 through 64. I was below our house and used to go down to the spring and just hang out. I got halfway down and looked across, and there was this big ape looking at me. It's still so clear, that moment. I do know that I left first, and I never said a word to anyone what I saw. 
Our house burned down in 67 or 68, and we moved to Eureka. When my sister and I became adults, I told her what I saw that day, and she started crying. She had experienced the same thing, only she was down at the spring, and he was above her on a log. I moved back to the home place the spring of 72, and everything was fine. I lived there with my son, and at the time, whoever needed a place. That fall, everyone pretty much left, and, as a nightly custom, I would build a fire, and my son and I would sit around it and eat. We had no electricity or anything. That hillside always rang with birdsong, never a quiet moment. But that night, there was a silence, and a weird feeling came over me, like eyes were watching. I grabbed my son and a few clothes, and we hiked down to the nearest house. I never went back there to live. It scared me that bad. Jim and Jan Gorrell were having a nighttime barbecue when they noticed that they were being watched in July 1965. What was watching them was a 9 to 10 foot tall Bigfoot. This was at Bowen's Ranch in San Bernardino County. The couple left hurriedly. At Laporte in Plumas County in autumn 1965, Mr. Herb Brown saw four deer followed by a Bigfoot in this part of the Sierra Nevada. Me and four other boys had found an old logging cabin about three miles up in the woods from Myers Flats and used this old shelter for several summers. One night, the last one, we were all camping for the weekend in this old place that we had fixed up. After cooking the evening meal, we all had eaten and went to bed. Sometime during the night, I was awakened by a huffing sound. I woke one of the other boys up and we listened to something slowly working its way all around the outside of the cabin. We woke up the three others, and we all listened. Whatever was outside was poking at the old rotted boards around the bottom of the shack. We could hear it shuffle around and pry at some of the boards. Finally, it moved around to the front door, which was only about five feet high, and Butch got my old twenty-two rifle and said, Open the door. I didn't want to open the door, but did anyway. Whatever it was was standing right in front of the opening, but because it was dark, all we could see were hairy legs. Butch fired the twenty-two, and this thing screamed and spun around and took off. Needless to say, we were scared to death. We heard two or three heavy thuds, and then everything was quiet. We tried to sleep, but ended up huddled together in the middle of the floor the rest of the night. The next morning, we went out as a group and searched the ground. There was a tore-up place where this thing spun around, and about three or four indentations in the ground where it took off. There was no blood on the ground anywhere. We packed up and never went back. In January 1966 at Wildwood in Trinity County, Bob Kelly and Archie Bradshaw saw a Bigfoot. Kelly had shot at the Bigfoot that had looked into a cabin window at 2 a.m. Tracks were found in the area that were not made by barefoot humans or bears. In April 1966, a group of campers saw Bigfoot several times. This occurred near Trinity Alps, north of Weaversville. At times the creature watched the group, threw garbage cans around, and eventually took food left out for it. In early July 1966, I was working as a counselor at Wilderness Summer Camp based at Mosquito Lake. Several counselors would sign up each session for excursions on one to three nights away in the backcountry. This hike was during the second session in early July. We had completed the major stretch of the four-hour journey when we came over the ridge and we could see East Boulder, about three-quarters of a mile below. There were four counselors and about 25 boys and girls, ranging in age from 9 to 15. We had stopped for a last gulp of water at a clearing just below the rim of the ridge when several of the campers began to squeal excitedly and pointing at the steep slope directly to the northeast and to the right of us, not more than 50 feet away, at the same elevation, stood an erect, hairy creature looking right back at us. One of the kids yelped, It's a bear! Tim, one of the counselors, muttered, That's no bear. The details are still very vivid in my memory. The creature was leaning against its left arm, which pushed it out from the canyon wall. The right arm swung back and forth as if for balance, and it bobbed its head irregularly. It was about five and a half feet tall, covered with long reddish-brown fur with a large flat face and round yellow eyes. During a discussion later, Sonny, who was studying biology at UC Davis, insisted that she observed the creature to have a hairless chest and large round protruding nipples. This led her to conclude that this was possibly female. 
The creature held its ground for a little over a minute before it spun around and ran away from our group up towards the rim to the right of us. As it ran, it sent a landslide of scree down into the valley below. When it reached the ridge, it turned and peered back at us once again and then disappeared over the edge. Much excitement followed, and the decision to continue down to the lake and set up camp was made. Curiously, there didn't seem to be a trace of fear among the children, although all the counselors, myself included, did admit later to being afraid. The first thing after dark that I noticed was a powerful odor that came from the Ponderosa Grove. The closest comparison I can come up with is the smell was skunk-like, but muskier with a hint of urine. The entire camp began to get a whiff of this odor, and the animated discussion about the sighting during the afternoon became hushed. In the quiet, we could hear landslides from a number of different places midway up the ridge, as well as a dim green light about the size of a small grapefruit. The odor intensified, and the snapping of branches, not more than ten yards away, sent the whole bunch of us into a cluster around the fire. The odor was intense, when a large shadow figure took several long, deliberate strides through a gap in the trees. It had to be about seven feet tall. I saw this creature only once, but others in the group saw several dark forms over the next two hours. Shortly after midnight, an 11-year-old boy in the group began to complain of great pains in his lower abdomen. The pain increased over the next hour to the point that he was laying on the ground, pulling his legs up toward his chest. The counselors agreed that it appeared that the camper was having an appendicitis attack. We drew sticks, and Larry and Tim headed out into the dark back to the main camp to bring a stretcher with a four-wheel drive truck to the logging road just over the south ridge. Sonny and I remained with the group, some of them sleeping and others tanning the fire. At the point when Tim and Larry's flashlights were no longer visible, the odor departed as well, and the night became still and quiet. The next morning, shortly after dawn, Tim, Larry, and Warren, the camp director, arrived at the camp with an olive-green military stretcher. Warren would later question every member of the group. He observed that the key element of the story were consistent in each telling. He conceded that we had indeed experienced something strange, but insisted that the counselors present agree to the possibility that what we had seen were bears. The green light still remains a mystery. This definitely appeared to be a group or family. In my opinion, they meant no harm and were genuinely curious about the children. They didn't make any loud screams or stomps as reported. They did not appear to want to scare the kids. This was the last excursion to East Boulder Lake that summer. In San Diego County, July 1966, five witnesses saw a six-foot-tall hairy humanoid ransacking their car. There was another hairy humanoid which was nonchalantly sitting on the side of the road. They were humanoids, not bears, and had long hair. The first tried to reach into the car window as they drove past later. Local mythology refers to bush beasts further north, near San Bernardino, where disappearances of children are more the norm. At Lytle Creek near Fontana, on August 27, 1966, two teenage girls in a car saw a moss and slime-covered hairy humanoid which suddenly stood up beside the car and scared them. Jerry Mendenhall was back in the car down a rough track when the Bigfoot stepped out of the bushes and grabbed her through the open window. She screamed and accelerated, and it walked back into the bushes. It smelled like a dead animal and was seven feet tall. Later, an officer from the sheriff's department found a large two-toed footprint, which was 17 inches long and six inches wide. It was called a bush beast by the locals. My encounter took place in Albion, Mendocino County, in the summer of 1966, when I was 15 years old. My father was a commercial fisherman and had his boat docked on the Albion River at the boat docks. We lived in Ukiah, and I came over to see my dad to bring him supplies and visit him at least twice a week. Soon after, we put a trailer on the flats near the boat dock and moved to the coast permanently. The encounter happened one evening just before dark, as the sun was just going down over the hill. My parents, younger sister, and younger brother were on the boat and getting ready for bed. It was before 8 p.m. My older sister and myself had to sleep in the car, as there wasn't enough bunks on the boat for us to sleep. The car was a 1957 two-door Pontiac Chieftain. I had the back seat, and she had the front. I remember it being too early and light out to want to go to sleep. We sat there and talked as teenagers will do. 
Across the river was a steep rolling hillside that had sheep grazing on it that belonged to a man named Paul Anderson. We had the windows down as it was summer and very nice out. We were interrupted in our talking by the sounds of sheep crying out in unison and baying in a way that didn't sound normal for sheep. We both jumped up and looked out the right side of the window trying to see what was after the sheep. We could see the sheep running frantically towards the west side of the hillside pasture. The sheep were scattering in different directions, separating into smaller bunches. To the left and upper part of the field, we both spotted two very large and hairy animals chasing the sheep. We thought that they were bears running on their hind legs like trained animals do. It was very alarming for us to watch these bears terrorizing these poor sheep. Our position from the attack was about 150 yards or more. We watched as these big animals chased the sheep for what seemed like hours. In reality, the whole chase scene was about 20 or 30 minutes. As it got dark, we were sure that the bears would swim the river and come for us next. We locked the doors and hid under the blankets for the rest of the night. It seemed like an eternity till morning came and we finally got out of the car and went to the boat to see our parents. We told them what had happened and I know that they thought we had stayed up all night dreaming up that story. That morning, we were up at the post office near where the attack had occurred, and people were talking about sheep being killed by a wild pack of dogs that were roaming around. The sheriff, Sam Costa, said it was unusual for dogs to kill and eat only the belly and insides of the sheep. We heard about the wild dogs for years after that, every time livestock were killed and mutilated by a predator. I never forgot what I saw and heard that night, and now know that this wasn't bears or wild dogs. Several sheep were killed and mutilated due to the attack. Everyone except my sister and myself believed that the predators were wild dogs. We actually believed that they were bears that had mastered how to run and walk and kill by standing exclusively on their hind legs. Years later, when I was living on my own in Fort Bragg, further up the coast, I heard of other sightings in the area. My father-in-law told me a story about seeing one when he was a young man living in Compte, near Albion. In the 1930s, he was in a wagon when a Bigfoot crossed the road in front of the horses. The driver said the big hairy thing did it all the time and called it a woodsman. This was on the road to Willits. Several other stories, including in the 1970s, two Bigfoots were stealing grain sacks near Albion. North of Fort Bragg on Ward Avenue, a Bigfoot was seen carrying an armload of fish. In 1966, our family kept a bee yard near Mount Shasta on the old Oregon Trail. One evening, after tending the bees, my father looked up toward the road home and saw a man standing near a stump of a tree. Then he heard a sort of yip yip yippy sound, somewhere between a coyote and a cowboy's roundup call, but very loud. Our old dog Queenie jumped into the car like she was scared. The man-like creature took off, loping away in a slow run with its arms sort of hanging down. When my dad drove closer to the stump later on, he realized that by the height of the stump and the height of the man or man-like creature, that it would have been much larger and taller than any normal man. We believe it was a Bigfoot. At Bluff Creek in 1966, Mr. Richard Sides saw a Bigfoot drinking from a creek with cupped hands. At Wildwood Inn in Trinity County, near Mount Shasta, in January 1967, Bob Kelly heard a strange moaning sound from outside and saw a Bigfoot. It was dark brown with silver-tipped hair, a flat nose, and no hair on its face or hands, and was looking into his house through a window. At 11.45 p.m. on February 18, 1967, a 7- to 10-foot tall creature was seen near Costa Mesa in Orange County. It had long pointed ears and was completely covered with hair. Another witness around the same time stated that the hairy creature appeared to lunge at his car and looked like an ape with arms waving about. Around the same time, there was a UFO reported in the same area. On a weekday in March 1967 in Siskiyou County, my husband was a teacher and had left for school. Our daughter had just gotten on the grade school bus, so it was after 8 o'clock. There had been no water, so I took the two little boys, three and a half and twenty months, and walked up the hill to clean the screen to the intake on the holding tank. This was taxing because I was eight months pregnant at the time. We had just gotten to the top and I was going to sit on a big tree stump. The cat had jumped on it and immediately arched her back, hair on end and screeched. I looked to see what she was looking at and there was a huge man-like thing. Its hair was long like a horse's mane and flowed. It was all black that I could see. 
It first dropped down and then got right back up and ran uphill, zigzagging around branches as it went. I grabbed the boys and ran down the hill so fast I could have gone a mile. My heart was really pumping. We have had trouble with bears some years. None of them stand. They run off on all fours. There are black bears, but if this was a bear, it bobbed up and down, and the hair was long and black on the head. When I see these Bigfoot photos, they don't look like what I saw, but mine turned and ran. We have cougars off and on, and those I worry about. They are seen going up our drive. Kitty sure saw it. My two boys didn't have a chance. I grabbed them and ran. They listen when I tell the story to their children, but do not add to the story. This happened in Northern California, west of Redding. We had horsebacked into a place we called Jones Camp at the base of Thompson Mountain. I dropped into a small stream bed, as the walking was easier, and it was in this creek bed where I saw the tracks. Neither my friend or I had a camera, and the only way we had of taking a rough measurement was going from one end of my gun barrel to about where the end of the foregrip was. Later we measured it back at camp, and it was about 15 inches long. Many times over the years we wished we would have had a camera, but we didn't. Too young, I guess. We followed the tracks downstream for 400 yards before they left the stream bed and took off up the mountain. The tracks were clear and looked to be very fresh, as the water was still oozing into the imprints in the silt areas. We also heard a large animal going through the red oaks ahead of us, but without seeing the animal, it could have been a bear. We never reported this to anyone, as we didn't want to be called nuts or whatever, but I tell you this, seeing those tracks sure made the hair stand up from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I'm a large guy, and my footprints were not near as deep in the mud as those were. At Borrego Sink, near Borrego Springs, in July 1968, Harold Lancaster, a treasure hunter, saw a sandy-colored giant hairy humanoid walking across the desert towards him. Harold fired at the man-beast to keep it away, and this seemed to work, as the startled creature jumped three feet into the air, looked at the witness, and ran off in the opposite direction to him. On Confidence Ridge, near Sonora, on January 6, 1968, Mr. Robert James Jr., a pilot, was flying over an area north of Yosemite National Park when his passenger saw a brown, fuzzy-haired creature about 10 to 12 feet tall on the ground 50 feet below them. They took another pass and took a photo. They landed the plane and returned to the sighting area where they found 20-inch long footprints, which they also photographed. This encounter occurred in July 1968 at Bullfrog Lake at 10,500 feet elevation while on a backpacking trip in the high Sierras of California. I was about 100 yards from our camp when I spotted what I thought was a bear cub looking around the camp. This was in broad daylight, around 3 in the afternoon. What really caught my attention was the concentrated interest this bear cub was paying to my backpack in particular. I stood in one place for about two minutes watching this sight from a hundred yards away when this bear cub stood up and began to walk away. At 18 years of age, I couldn't force my mind to accept what my eyes were telling me. I watched the baby Bigfoot, approximately four and a half feet tall, walk away from me into the trees for probably a full minute in duration. It disappeared into the trees at a distance of 200 to 250 yards from me. Its arms swung like a person's and walked with a smooth gait, not at all like a chimp or gorilla. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck, and I had a sense that I was witnessing something unnatural. I didn't tell anyone about this incident until recently. It was clear weather, small patches of snow still around, basically flat terrain, and about ten yards north of a small stream feeding into Bullfrog Lake. During the fall of 1968, in Calaveras County, my father and I went deer hunting in the area of Railroad Flats. We arrived late one afternoon and set up camp. Then we decided to go separate ways and scout the area around camp for sign of deer. I climbed a small rise and came to an open area with a wide path running along the top of the hill. I proceeded to follow the path for a short, for a short ways, but I had an uncomfortable feeling. I didn't see any deer tracks, so I returned to where we had camped. The next morning, I discovered it had rained lightly during the night, leaving the ground muddy. I climbed the rise to the place where I had been the day before. When I came to the path, I immediately saw large footprints, 
They were very deep in the mud and about 14 or 15 inches in length. They were shaped like human bare feet. They were heading down the path that I had followed the day before. Some of the footprints were on top of the ones that I had left the day before. I proceeded to follow them down the path. When the path sloped downwards, the prints slid, leaving elongated prints. The path continued along the ridge top, but the tracks suddenly took a left turn, heading off the trail and down the side into the trees and underbrush. Needless to say, I didn't follow them. It was in a remote area, and I don't believe that anyone was near where we were camped to have faked the footprints. In Fontana, in 1968, a hairy humanoid was seen by a neighborhood boy. The following night, Jerry Lee Welchel was with two children she was babysitting. A girlfriend had asked her to go to where the creature had been seen the night before. Jerry went there with her friend and saw it approach her. It was hairy, big, and smelly. In fact, it smelled terrible. The Bigfoot reached its hand inside the car as she started it and brushed against and brushed her and brushed against her face and scratched it. In Oroville, on July 12, 1969, at 9.30 p.m., Mr. Charlie Jackson, his six-year-old son Kevin, and his dogs ran for cover. They had been watching a bonfire they had built when they saw a female hairy humanoid standing on an old building 15 feet away. She had black skin on her chest and face, which was almost bare, though the rest of her was covered with filthy gray hair. She was seven to eight feet tall and had no neck and also had giant flat breasts which hung down to her navel. She had a puzzled look on her face, her arms were longer than a human's arms, and she swung her arms when walking. The hairy humanoid was three or four feet wide at the shoulders and had a yellowish chest area. The feet were 14 to 15 inches long and very flat and very wide. The three normally very fierce dogs were cowering under the furniture inside the house. Thanks for listening. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at BigfootCaseFiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.